Please turn with me in your Bibles to 3rd John, the book of 3rd John, uh, right at the end of the New Testament there, 3rd uh, John and then Jude and then Revelation. Uh, we've been doing a study, uh, preaching through 1st John, 2nd John, and now 3rd John, and um, I think like 2nd John, we'll probably do 3rd John in two uh, messages. We'll get, Lord willing, to verse 8 today. Uh, Let's go ahead and uh, go before the Lord in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you that you use sinful people to uh, accomplish your purposes. It's something that we marvel at. Uh, We recognize that we are inadequate for these things, and yet you have given abundant grace. And so we pray that you might help us as we look at the truth of the passage in front of us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In 1997, a woman's studies and English professor from Syracuse University wrote an article that was published in the local newspaper. She was uh, a lesbian, a fan of Freud, Marx, and Darwin, and a supporter of the LGBT movement. She wrote an article against a particular Christian movement, and the response to this article was that mail flooded her office. She decided that she was going to sort the mail into two boxes, and so she had on her desk a box for hate mail and a box for fan mail. One letter, though, did not fit in either box. The pastor of Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church, Ken Smith, wrote a letter to the author of the article, which by now you may know is Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria couldn't fit the letter into either box, and she recounts the event, and she says, I'm going to read here, she says, Ken Smith encouraged me to explore the kind of questions I admire. How did you arrive at your interpretations? How do you know you're right? Do you believe in God? Ken didn't argue with my article. Rather, he asked me to defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. I didn't know how to respond to it, so I threw it away. Later that night, I fished it out of the recycling bin and put it back on my desk where it stared at me for a week, confronting me with the worldview divide that demanded a response. The letter that Ken sent Rosaria included an invitation to dinner. Rosaria accepted. She became friends with Ken and his wife, Floyd. Rosaria said this, when we ate together, Ken prayed in a way I had never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. Eventually, to God's glory, Rosaria Butterfield repented of her sin and became a believer in Christ. She described her life after her conversion and said this, But when I came to Christ, I experienced what 19th century Scottish theologian Thomas Calmers called the expulsive power of a new affection. At the time of my conversion, my lesbian identity and feelings did not vanish. As my union with Christ grew, the sanctification that it birthed put a wedge between my old self and my new one. In time, this contradiction exploded, and I was able to claim identity in Christ alone. Rosara went on to write a book that some of you I know have read, uh, entitled The Gospel Comes with a House Key, uh, published by Crossway. She discussed the importance of Christian hospitality and how it complements the gospel. Indeed, without hospitality, Rosaria never would have come to Christ. And as Christians, we are called to go and do likewise. We are called to go and practice hospitality. And that is not just a requirement for pastors. Of course, you know that Titus and Timothy give this as a qualification for pastors. Pastors must be hospitable. But scripture 
indicates to us that this is not just a requirement for pastors, but a command to all Christians. And just take a couple of passages in consideration. I'm just going to read just the appropriate segment here. In Romans 12, 13, Paul says that true Christians should be pursuing hospitality. In Timothy, Paul says that widows are eligible for financial support from the church only if she has shown hospitality to strangers. The author of Hebrews says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And in 1 Peter, Peter says, be hospitable to one another. And he adds this sometimes needed statement without grumbling. (laughs) Third John, our present passage, gives to us Christian principles behind this command to be hospitable. John encourages a man to continue in Christian hospitality. Let's read the first eight verses here. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brothers came and bore witness to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers and are doing this though they are strangers and they bore witness to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, receiving nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth." John begins here with uh, an introduction. In 3 John, uh, in verse 1, he says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now, you may remember from our study in 2 John that there was some discussion because John wrote to a lady. And we were wondering, did John write to a specific lady? Or was he using this in maybe more of a metaphorical sense to refer to the church at large? Uh, But there's no question about it in 3 John. We know that John is writing to an individual, and he specifically names this individual, and the man's name is Gaius. Now, the name Gaius was one of, and possibly, according to one commentator, the most common name in the Roman Empire. And so it is difficult to say with any kind of certainty to know which Gaius John was writing to. The name Gaius appears in the Greek New Testament five times, and according to a 4th century document, the Gaius in 3 John is the Gaius of Derby, who is referred to in Acts 20 in verse 4, and who was, at least for a short time, a traveling companion of Paul. Now, we have no way to verify this. Um, And so we simply have to conclude we don't know which Gaius he was specifically writing to, whether it was one of the ones mentioned in the New Testament or whether it was one that was not referred to in Scripture. In any event, we do know that John is writing to an individual and not a church. And on this, John affirms his love for the man. He writes to this man named Gaius, and he says, whom I love in truth. And you may recall that... John uses the same phrase in 2 John 1 where he addresses the elect lady and her children. And then he says, whom I love in what? In truth. And so we see this theme of truth come out again in 3 John. We saw this in 1 John. We see this in 2 John. And now we also see this in 3 John. The emphasis that we made at that time Uh, and went off on a little bit of explanation, and I won't repeat all of that, but the emphasis that we went to that time was to say that Christians find a shared unity around truth. In our current day and age, with the current spirit of the age, uh, we live in a culture that really seeks to downplay truth. We live in a climate of moral relativism or postmodernism, where truth is seen not as something that is transcendent. Truth is not seen as something that transcends culture and time, uh, but truth is seen as something that can be 
relative to the individual. In some circles, it's even popular to treat truth the same way that you might treat your favorite kind of ice cream. Uh, This is my favorite flavor, and this is your favorite flavor, and there's not one that's uh, right or wrong. But in this context, John is reminding us, though subtly, that truth is absolute, that truth is truth, and that it's not open for debate. And Christians, moreover, find shared unity with one another around the truth. We are called, as we saw last time, uh, to increase our agreement with one another. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians in particular. And so Christians find unity around the truth. Surrounded by a sea of moral relativism, Christians do not compromise on the truth. We are to, as the passage says, love one another in truth. In uh, verse 2, John says, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. John prays, of course, for a friend in this verse. And you can see the uh, tender affection that he has toward this man, Gaius. He cares about him. He writes to him saying that he hopes that that uh, he recognizes that his soul is prospering, as we'll see in a moment here. But he also prays that he might have good physical health. Now, you won't find, by the way, anything in this verse that leads one to believe in the so-called prosperity gospel. Nothing of that brand of false teaching can be found here. He simply has a friend and he cares about him and he simply prays for good health. And we should, by the way, do the same. I do not wish ill health on anyone. And my prayer and heart's desire for all of you is that as members of Crossview Church, as friends, is that all of you would be in good health. That's my uh, desire for all of you. Um, You see, the prosperity gospel has no issue praying for the health of others like 3 John 2 says. Rather, the prosperity gospel has a problem with Luke 22, verse 42, where Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And that really is the attitude that we're supposed to pray for one another with. We can pray and should pray for the good health of one another, as John prays for his friend Gaius here. At the end of the day, we are to say, though, not my will, but your will be done, recognizing that God is sovereign and I am not. At any rate, God, John acknowledges the prospering soul of his friend. He prays that his health would prosper in a similar manner to his soul. And then he says in verse 3, I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and bore witness to your truth, that is how you are walking in the truth. And so what John is beginning to unfold in this letter for us is uh, a scenario where he has this friend Gaius, and there are some brothers in Christ who have come to John, and they have reported that John is doing, uh, or they reported that Gaius is doing very well. Uh, And so John says simply, I rejoiced. The brothers came, they told me that you're walking in the truth, which leads to verse 4, where he says, I have no greater joy than this that my children are walking in the truth. This leads us to believe that Gaius is probably one of John's spiritual children. That is to say that John shared the gospel with the man Gaius. Gaius heard the gospel. He repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what John has discovered is that he is prospering in his new walk with Christ. He's prospering as a Christian. He's going on. And he has not fallen away. He's not one of those seeds that sprouted up quickly for a little while that Jesus talks about. And then all of a sudden, persecution came along and it withered away. No, this is one that has proven, uh, Gaius has proven to be a genuine convert. He has proven that he has not given a false profession of faith, but that he truly is one of uh, the Lord's children. And so John responds to this by saying, I'm praying that your health would prosper as your soul is prospering. And by the way, I heard that your soul is prospering, and I have no greater joy than to know that my children are continuing to walk in the truth. Um, 
Now, I think you can, I, I think, I think in context, John is referring to his spiritual children. I do think this also applies to one's physical children as well, and not just one's spiritual children. Uh, obviously, every parent, their greatest joy, as I mentioned this last time, is that their actual children grow up to repent, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to become Christians, and then to continue walking in that Christian truth. Uh, A child's path in life could either be a parent's greatest joy or a parent's greatest sorrow. There's a proverb that says something similar to this, and you probably could put this right in the margin next to 3 John 4, but Proverbs 10 and verse 1, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. Likewise, Spurgeon says, I have seen good men and great men crushed beneath the daily trouble caused by their children. Children are a blessing, and they can be made by God the choicest of blessings. But if they shall grow up to be dissolute, impure, ungodly, they will make our hearts ache. It is thus perplexing that so many parents care more about a child's academic success than his spiritual success. And I'll quote Spurgeon a couple more times here. He actually preached an entire sermon on this one verse, and there was a lot of uh, gold nuggets in that message, Uh, but I'm going to quote him a couple more times here. He says... On this topic, they joy, that is parents, in them, that is their children, if they're healthy in body, but they're not saddened, though the leprosy of sin remains upon them. Spurgeon is talking about parents who care more about the academic success or the health, well-being of their children in that way, even though they're not Christians. He says they joy in their comely looks and they do not inquire whether they have found favor in the sight of the Lord. Put the girl's feet in silver slippers, and many heads of families would never raise the question as to whether she walked in the broad or narrow road. It's a very, it is very grievous to see how some professedly Christian parents are satisfied so long as their children display cleverness in learning or sharpness in business, although they show no signs of a renewed nature. And of course, Spurgeon is not saying that those other things are unimportant. He's simply saying that they're not the most important thing. The most important thing, of course, is that we know that we have a right relationship with the Lord. We are born as sinful creatures by default at enmity with God. You are not born morally good. You are not born morally neutral. You are born an enemy of God from the womb. And what Spurgeon is simply noting here is that the most important thing is that a child comes to know Christ. And he says, I'm shocked that there are parents who care nothing for this. They should. And a true Christian parent will echo the sentiment of 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than this than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Spurgeon says this then, He says, alas, if our children lose the crown of life, it will be but a small consolation that they have won the laurels of literature or art. You know, give your own soul for this, what? Of course, back in the words of 3 John, I have no greater joy than this than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What parent does not want to hear this? Every parent wants their child to walk in truth. John Frame describes it this way. He says, to walk in the truth is to obey the commands of God. And in this regard, Spurgeon says, Beloved, if you love your pastor, if you love the Bible, if you love the gospel, if you love Christ, if you love God, be a holy people. Those then who live their lives disobeying the commands of God not only dishonor their Lord, first of all, but they also grieve their spiritual parents, and their natural parents. 
Some of you know this. Some of you have experienced a wayward child firsthand. Some of you have seen it secondhand in someone else. And you know that this consumes almost every moment of a parent's life to think my child has gone in this direction. It, it tears a person apart. Therefore, put away all manner of sin and disobedience. And by the way, talking to everyone, but let me talk to you children, okay? Honor your parents. Put aside sin and disobedience. Work hard and set laziness aside. And everybody here today, put down and put away pornography, coarse jesting, sexual innuendos, anger, worry, nagging, passivity, dishonoring your parents, immorality, greed, lying, idolatry, effeminacy, theft. And then in the words of Colossians chapter 3, so as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and graciously forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. And above all of these things, Crossview Church, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, with all wisdom, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, Crossview Church, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Or, to summarize this, we could say in the words of 3 John, walk in truth. Brings no, there's no greater delight to a parent than to realize and see and recognize that your child is walking in the path of Colossians chapter 3. Walk in wisdom. John says that this brings a parent the greatest joy. Let me just say, if there is any parent who is experiencing the grief that comes from a wayward child, and your child right now is wandering it's just, it's not too late. Go and impact that child for the sake of Christ. Whether they're in your home, whether they're outside of your home, wherever that child is, go point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the present text, what John is observing here is that his friend and spiritual child, Gaius, is walking in the truth. He is following after Scripture. He's following through on what Colossians 3 says our life is to look like. But I want to kind of drill in here a little bit because what's going on is that John is making an observation about something very specific. He says he's walking in truth, but he gives a very specific example of how he's walking in truth. And he tells us this, beginning in verse 5. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers and are doing this though they are strangers. Now this is going to kind of um, become clearer and clearer and clearer as we look at the next couple of verses. But in verse 5, he is introducing to us the fact that what Gaius was doing is Gaius was showing hospitality to Christian brothers. 
You may recall in 2 John that the lady was showing hospitality to who? Remember this? Yeah, deceivers, false teachers. The lady in 2 John, John was writing to this lady, whether an individual or the church, and this lady was showing hospitality to false teachers and bringing these false teachers into her home or the homes of the people in the church so that they could then go and spread this false teaching probably was done out of a heart of compassion. And what John says is that they went too far in this regard. He says, you shouldn't even give them a greeting, let alone have them come into your home. Okay. Third John is the corollary to that. So it's almost like to get this full range view of Christian hospitality, you need both 2 John and 3 John. You're probably familiar and you've seen uh, before that sometimes um, from time to time a group of Christians will make a statement of faith that is uh, centered around affirmations and denials. Familiar with that before? You've seen maybe a statement that says, we affirm this, we deny this. Okay? And that's kind of what 3 John and 2 John are next to to one another. We affirm that you should show Christian hospitality to ministers of the gospel who are traveling, sharing Christ. We deny that you should show hospitality to false teachers. That's kind of what 2 and 3 John together are, it's kind of what, what these two letters are doing. Um, John says in verse 5 that Gaius is helping Christian brothers. He says, you're acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers. And he says he's doing this even though they're strangers to him. Gaius is, is not, uh, he's, he's showing hospitality to people who are traveling, sharing the gospel without even knowing them, bringing strangers into his home. And he continues in verse 6 by saying, they bore witness to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. He's saying you're taking these people into your home. They're doing Christian ministry. And he's saying you would do well to take these people and to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. In other words, if we can summarize what John is saying here, is he's saying, you're doing great, keep doing the same thing. He's commending him for his faithfulness in gospel ministry. He tells John to send out these traveling ministers in a way that honors the Lord. Now, one technical note here, and this kind of bleeds over into 2 John as well, is that most likely this kind of hospitality is more than just room and board for the night. Okay, this is not like someone comes to the front desk, they get their room key, they go to their room, and then you don't see them until they leave at that point. This kind of Christian hospitality is going a little bit further. In fact, Gaius is probably resupplying these traveling ministers. He's giving them provisions for the road, and that's kind of implied by the statement, send them on their way. And you see something similar in Titus, in Titus 3 and verse 13. Diligently help send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. The idea that you have these traveling ministers, they come into your home, you show them hospitality, it's now time for them to go out on the road and you send them with provisions for their journey ahead. Uh, John tells Gaius two reasons why he should send these traveling ministers out in a manner worthy of God. Do you see them here in verse 6? Oh, I'm sorry, verse 7. He says, first of all, they went out for the sake of the name. That's Christ. And second, they're receiving nothing from the Gentiles. So first of all, these traveling missionaries 
ministers, they're not out traveling the roads because it's a comfortable life. In fact, in many places in the first century, as you know, uh, there was a great risk to your life depending on where you would travel. Um, And so these people are not out traveling on the road because it's a comfortable life. They don't have uh, an air-conditioned RV that they're on the road with, okay? They, they are actually out traveling dangerous roads. And he says that they're out for the sake of the name or for the sake of Christ or for the sake of the gospel. They want to advance the gospel. They want to propagate the gospel. They've taken very seriously their Lord's command to go and preach the gospel to all nations. And so John is encouraging his friend to continue supporting these uh, individuals, But beyond this, the second reason that John says that they ought to be supported is because they are receiving nothing from Gentiles or from unbelievers. They went out for the sake of the name, receiving nothing from the Gentiles. I think 3 John 7 presents us with a biblical precedent that we are not to seek financial support from unbelievers. Okay, We as a church are not to go out into the community and have some kind of a fundraiser just out there, okay? We, there is something about what we are doing that the Lord says here in 3 John 7 that there is something admirable and noteworthy and good and right about a church seeking support from other Christians. I don't think the church is supposed to seek support from the government, from grants, or from appeals to the local community. The church seeks support from believers. Missionaries seek support from believers. Now, I understand and I recognize that anyone can come off the street and go to our offering box in the back here and throw money in, okay? That's going to happen, and that happens, and that kind of a thing. And I think that that's okay. What I'm saying is, as a matter of principle, the church is not to seek out unbelievers to receive funds, and there are all kinds of problems that can happen uh, when that is the case. John says that because these traveling ministers are going out, number one, for the sake of the gospel, and number two, they're going out without receiving anything from unbelievers, all the more reason for you to give them the financial support and aid. They're actually being consistent. They're actually, there's something commendable about them. They're actually, in principle, not seeking out financial aid from unbelievers, and therefore, you ought to support them all the more. Uh, He says, we, therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. We are to support such men. One side note here, and I think this is worth mentioning is that we should be quick to support Christian enterprises. It's a good thing for us to give financial support to good Christian works. Therefore, we ought to support such men, as the text says. I would say that it's a good thing to support good parachurch organizations. Um... A great one is Answers in Genesis, the wonderful ministry that we have uh, loved for many years. Um, And there are lots of Christian works similar to that that are worthy of receiving Christian support. Now, by the way, let me just add a little side note here that that's not at the expense of supporting your own local church, okay? Um, I don't think that you can say, I'm going to replace my quote-unquote tithe to the local church by supporting something else over here. Um, I think there's biblical precedent for you to support the work in front of you first, and then as the Lord prospers you beyond that, uh, you can support these other kinds of ministries and organizations. Um, And beyond that, let me add another kind of side note here. I would even say that there is something noteworthy and noble and good about Christians being quick to support other Christian entrepreneurs in our own congregation. Um, 
there are some of you who own your own business or there are people who work out. We should support one another, right? We should help one another. We should do business with one another. And that should be able to be done without conflict and that kind of a thing. Um, And by the way, I keep adding these side notes. I'm sorry. Side note, side note, side note, side note. Side note. Um, Don't ask them for a discount, okay? Now, sometimes they'll give that to you, okay? And some of you have given me discounts, so I'm trying not to be hypocritical here. I have never asked for one in my life, okay? (laughs) If you have given me a discount, then... Praise the Lord for your kindness in that way, okay? (laughs) They can give it, okay? I'm just saying don't be a cheapskate, okay? Support one another, love one another, okay? You see what I'm saying? Therefore, we ought to support such men, okay? Support those in, uh, in your own church and other good Christians that you know. I'm not saying you can't do business with unbelievers, but... Um, as much as we can, let's, let's do business with one another and support one another and encourage one another in that way. Um, the end result of what John is saying in the passage is that when you are supporting these uh, Christian ministers, when you support them, he says, you become fellow workers with the truth with them. Okay? Now, do you remember the corollary to this in 2 John? Do you, re- do you remember? It's, it's almost like this section of 3 John and that section of 2 John, it's like they're mere images of one another. And he's saying, don't show hospitality in this way because you become fellow workers with them in what they're doing. Do show hospitality in this way because you do, show, uh, you do become a fellow worker in this way. Okay, so the corollary to 3 John 8, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth, is 2 John 11. And you'll see that here. The one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Okay, so he's basically saying that when you show hospitality and support these traveling ministers in this way, you are either, if they're propagating false truth, you're participating in their evil deeds. Or if they're spreading good truth of the gospel, you're becoming a fellow worker in sharing the truth with them. But in neither case are you neutral. It's not just that I'm showing hospitality in a neutral fashion. It's I'm showing hospitality for a positive good or for a negative evil in that regard. And so he basically is just encouraging us to think through how we're showing hospitality to people. Do this, but don't do this. And as he said in 2 John, he said, some of you are going too far. That is to say, you've become influenced by, um, and maybe even perhaps what was going on is that these false teachers were playing on their sympathy and playing on their compassion and playing on their love and actually taking that as a tool to manipulate them to be able to get what they wanted and propagate their false teaching. When you help to subsidize someone else's work, you participate in some degree to what they do. In 2 John, that participation is one that is inclined toward evil. In 3 John, that participation is one that is inclined toward good. You see the full scope of this? He says in 3 John 8 that those who give hospitality to these men may be fellow workers with the truth. One might say then, uh, say it this way. If you cannot go into missions, then support missions. You have one of two options as a Christian. Either you descend down the well, the hole into the work of missions, or you hold the rope for the one who is descending down into the work of missions. Uh, And that's certainly not to say that what we're doing here can't be counted as missions, 
we certainly are, and those who are in the new membership class know that we talked about this today, is that mission work happens whether it's in another country or whether it's with your next door neighbor. All of that is mission work. And so from that perspective, we all are to be missionaries. Okay? Uh, at the same time, we are to support godly individuals who are going out into the uh, other countries or wherever it may be, church planting in the states, church planting in other countries, support them uh, by holding the ropes for them. And so the admonition then, quite straightforwardly here in 3 John, is simply to help support those who are doing godly works and godly deeds. You find someone who's doing something good for the work of Christ, then help them in that. Support them in that. Show hospitality to them. Bring them into your home. Uh, Some of you may be familiar with uh, a document from the early church uh, after the New Testament was written called the Didache. Uh, This was essentially a document that was uh, a manual of sorts for what does it look like to put all these Christian truths into practice. And the Didache has a section uh, devoted to Christian hospitality and is an expansion on 2nd and 3rd John. Now, the Didache is not part of the inspired text of Scripture, but it is a very helpful document uh, to look at and see how was the early church processing many of these kinds of things. The Didache says that if a Christian traveler, a minister, was traveling through a town, you should not give him a place to stay for more than two or three days. In fact, if he stayed for three or more days, uh, it was said that he was uh, a false teacher or not a Christian. Um, And that if he was going to stay for more than three days, the Didache says he needs to go find a job. Now, can you kind of guess what the reason for this is? You have these men in the early church who say, just like there's charlatans out there today. And these men in the early church might say, you know what, I think I can make a living for myself just by traveling around and cobbling together some kind of message about love and kindness and all this kind of stuff. And so they end up going out and being moochers, okay, living off of these people in the church. Um. This was a way, according to the Didache, to um, prevent people from playing on your emotions, wanting a free ride. Um, And so uh, even then, they were wrestling through the implications and the details of how all this uh, worked out. Now, I'm not saying that there's a a rule about a number of days. Um, I think probably the best way to do this today is when a church brings in a traveling minister of some sort, is to first and foremost check with that person's home church and make sure that they are being held accountable by that home church, okay? And one case in point is you guys know the whole story of Ravi Zacharias, right? You know, you know all that's come out with him. One of the dangers, I think, of being in a traveling ministry is that you can go out into the world with zero accountability. Nobody knows where you are this day. Nobody knows where you are that day. Nobody knows if you're at this hotel or that hotel. Nobody knows how long you're staying at this church versus that church. Nobody knows where you were in between those two churches and all those kinds of things. Any traveling minister, I would say, uh, that we would bring into here today, first, we need to have a conversation with that pastor. Are they being held accountable? Do you know what's going on with them in that kind of a thing? And um, it can be done well. And when we find it being done well, then we should support those people, as this passage says. But we also, in light of 2 John, practice discernment. So where do we go uh, from here? Understand this. 3 John is giving to us the corollary truth to 2 John. Whereas 2 John is a warning not to participate in ungodly hospitality... Third John is an admonition to participate in godly hospitality. And we saw in our introductory story how the Lord uses godly hospitality for good, bringing in someone who is an unbeliever, sharing the gospel with them, and seeing the Lord convert that soul.
In particular, 3 John is an encouragement to participate in hospitality, specifically with those who are spreading Christian truth, missionaries, evangelists, traveling ministers, so on and so forth. We're to be generous, giving, sacrificial as we minister to them. And certainly hospitality is one of the ways in which we express Christian love, which Jesus says is the mark of a true Christian. In light of this, I have six points of application today. Number one, pursue unity with other Christians, love one another in truth. I'm taking this from 3 John verse 1. Remember, this was something we emphasized more last time. We are to find unity and love one another in truth. We are to grow in like-mindedness with one another. Whereas the world celebrates uh, ethical and moral and religious diversity where everyone believes in contradictory truths, we as Christians are to grow in greater unity towards believing the truth of Scripture. We're to grow in like-mindedness. Second point of application is children, and I'm talking about spiritual children as well as biological children, physical children, adopted children, all of it, walk in truth, first to the glory of God, but also for the joy of your parents. That's a good thing, by the way, not a bad thing. That's something that we ought to pursue. So parents, you have my permission to drill this point of application home in the car ride on the way home with your kids. Uh, Third point, parents, invest in your children and pray for their spiritual success. Okay, We have that modeled for us here in this passage as well. Myriads of ways to do this, uh, but we're not to be neutral toward this in any way. Next point of application is everyone put off sin and put on Christ-likeness. And I put our Colossians passage in there. That's the put off and the put on list. Number five, show Christian hospitality without expecting anything in return. Be generous. Be kind. It is a great joy and delight for me as a pastor when I hear, oh, I was over at so-and-so's house this week. Oh, so I, I, I love that. I hear people all the time who are coming here, even as very new visitors, saying, oh, we're at this person's house this week, and next week we're at this person's house. Praise the Lord for that. Um, Keep doing that. Uh, Show Christian hospitality. And then finally, be fellow workers with the truth by generously supporting Christians, churches, missions, parachurch organizations. Find people who are doing a good work for the Lord and join them by holding the ropes for them. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us. Thank you for this passage. We pray that you might help us to honor you in our obedience to your commands. I pray that we would pursue the uh, put-on commands of Colossians, that we would put off the sin uh, that so easily clings to us, and that we would put on Christ's likeness loving one another, setting aside our sinful passions for the sake of Christ. Help us uh, to follow through with what 3 John uh, tells us to, which is to practice godly hospitality, to support people, to encourage them, and to love others for the sake of the truth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.